Now we come to the parable that begins a lot of problems. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you, he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There are people who teach that this applies to the church. Have you heard that? You've heard it. And they teach that if you as a believer are not ready and not busy doing the Lord's service, you are not only going to be cut in two, but you will be given your portion with the hypocrites and you will be weeping and wailing and gnashing your teeth. And I'm here to tell you that is false. And the reason it is false, as I've tried to build a case all the way through, this is not talking to the church. Now, there are applications. Hold your place here and turn with me to First John. There are things that we should be very aware and concerned of. Verse 28. Now, little children, abide in him. What does abide in him mean? Live a, a life of fellowship and obedience. So he says, little children, abide in him so that when he appears, when is he appearing for us? Rapture of the church. We may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If the teaching of the perseverance of the saints is true, John just wasted precious space. Correct? I mean, if the fact that you're saved means that you automatically are going to persevere to the end, then what good is this warning at the end of verse 28? But the, the point is, there will be some believers that are going to be ashamed at his coming. Why? Because they've wasted their time, they've wasted their life, they've wasted their resources, they've lived for themselves, they've ignored the word of God, on and on and on down the line. Verse 29, if you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practice righteousness is born of him. So the better you know him, the better you will reflect him. You know that he is righteous. You know that everyone practicing righteousness is born of him. All right. So can we find application of what we're seeing here in Matthew 24? Of course. But we don't want to turn application into interpretation. So here's the evil servant. He says, the master delays his coming. He beats his fellow servants. He eats and drinks with the drunkards. The master of the servant comes at a day that he's not looking, an hour he is not aware of, cuts him into and appoints him his portion with what? The hypocrites. So here's what they'll teach you. They being people who believe the false teaching on this passage. You as a believer have lived a hypocritical life and hypocrites are going to receive a portion of weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth, and so on and so forth. There's just one problem. Scripture cannot contradict itself. Turn with me to Luke chapter 12. Let's start in verse 42. 
And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all he has. Is this the same story? Verse 45, But if that servant says in his heart, My master delays his coming, he begins to meet, beat the maid servants, men servants and maid servants, and to eat and drink and be drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him at an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. Who has their portion with unbelievers? An unbeliever. This is not talking about believers and it is certainly not talking about the church. It's talking about unbelievers. Now, I have another question for you. How is it possible that both the wise servant, the faithful servant, and the evil servant are called servants of God? Is it possible for an unbeliever to be called a servant of God? Interpretation, folks. How many... Hundred or more times, two hundred times, I've lost count. In the Old Testament, is the entire nation of Israel referred to as my servant Israel? Let's go back to Romans. All of this keeps leading to Romans. <laughs> Paul's interpretation in Romans chapter 9. Verse 1, I tell the truth in Christ. There's the first witness. I am not lying. There's the second witness. My conscience bears me witness. There's the third witness. In the Holy Spirit, there's four witnesses that Paul calls to account. That I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Who is he talking about? Is Paul expressing in these verses his own attitude which is contrary to God or his own attitude which is the same as God's? Is he expressing here the heart of God? Absolutely. God's desire as expressed by Christ in Matthew 23, 37, was Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you together, but you would not. The breaking heart and the tears of the Lord in Matthew 23 is the breaking heart and the tears of Paul in Romans 9. They're expressing the same thought. Verse 4, who are Israelites? To whom pertains the adoption? You remember Hosea 11.1, 1, Out of Egypt I have brought my son. There are two terms that are used for Jesus Christ throughout the Old Testament as the coming Messiah that are also applied to the nation of Israel, which brought him forth, and they are servant and son. All of those in the nation of Israel were given the privileges that Paul speaks of in verse 4 and 5. They all shared the same divine treasure. They are called Israelites. What did the name Israel mean? A prince having power with God and men. It was the name change of Jacob. To whom pertains the adoption, the glory? What was the glory? the visible presence of the glory of God, the Shekinah glory in the tabernacle, and the covenants. You have the Abrahamic covenant. You have the land covenant. You have the Mosaic covenant. And the giving of the law. How did they receive the law? They received it at Sinai. The glory of God appeared on the mountain. It was written in the table of stones by the finger of God, correct? Correct. What other nation ever had anything like that happen? None. And the service of God. How many Israelites were given the service of God? 
all of them. Specifically here, he's referring to the uh, ministry of the tabernacle, but it belonged to all of them. They were all called to serve, not in the tabernacle, but as an extension of the tabernacle and all that it meant. And the promises. What kind of promises? Promises of a king, promises of a kingdom, promises of a land, promises of blessing. All of those promises were given to every single child of Israel. Of whom are the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? What did God say? I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Of whom, according to the flesh, Christ came. All of these provisions, all of these treasures, all of these riches were pointing forward to the greatest treasure of all, the coming of the Son of God in the flesh of a Jew. And when they rejected him, they lost it all. Because you can't have the blessings without the source of the blessing. You can't have the gifts without the giver. And Paul goes on through Romans 9, 10, and 11 to show us that because of their rejection of their Savior, like Pharaoh, who hardened his heart and was destroyed, the nation of Israel had hardened their heart, and because of their unbelief, they would be destroyed, and therefore they would suffer the fate of their unbelief. They would receive their portion with the unbelievers. That's the point that I'm trying to make to you. 